Good evening and welcome to the COVID-19 update on Channel's television. I'm Millicent Womoka. First, the highlights. Federal government flags off second phase of the vaccination exercise. Frontline workers in Jigawa State receive training on oxygen administration to patients battling with COVID-19 and pneumonia. And Australia's biggest city, Sydney, records deadliest day of the pandemic. Residents in Melbourne face a further two weeks of lockdown amid a surge of infections. And according to the Nigeria Centre for Disease Control, NCDC, the symptoms of the Delta variant of COVID-19 are the same. Fever, dry cough, sore throat, headaches, body pain, tiredness, loss of taste and smell and difficulty breathing. The centre, which announced 541 new cases last night, also maintains that there is no specific cure yet for COVID-19. However, it says there are many ongoing clinical trials to test various potential antivirals. The NCDC adds that the current management of cases aims to relieve the symptoms while the body's immune system fights the illness. Let's take a look at the update. Nigeria's daily case counts dropped slightly in the last 24 hours as the NCDC announced 541 new coronavirus infections recorded in 12 states and the federal capital territory, indicating a drop by 124 from the figures reported earlier. With 242 cases, Lagos remains on top of the country's daily infection toll, followed by Aquaibum with 94 infections. Enugu and Oyo states reported 48 infections each. Anambra had 34 cases. Rivers had 19, while Ogun had 17 cases. 15 cases were registered in Ikiti. Nine cases were reported in the FCT. Kwara had seven. Abia had five. And two cases were reported in Delta, while Niger registered one case. There were zero cases reported from Gombe, Nasarawa, Ondo, Oshun, Plateau, and Sokoto states. The overall count of confirmed cases in Nigeria now stands at 182,503. There have been 306 discharges in the last 24 hours, increasing the total number of recoveries to 167,132. The NCDC says there was no recorded COVID-19 fatality within the last 24 hours, leaving the death toll at 2,219. Presently, the active cases in Nigeria have exceeded 13,000, while over 2.5 million samples have been tested so far. In Africa, there are over 7.2 million confirmed cases and more than 183,000 deaths recorded across countries on the continent. The total global confirmed cases have now surpassed 207 million, while more than 4.3 million deaths have been reported. The federal government has flagged off the second phase of the COVID-19 vaccination exercise. This is coming months after the conclusion of the first phase. Well, this phase will target health workers, vulnerable groups and hard-to-reach communities. Members of the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19 urged leaders to intensify mobilization efforts to ensure 100% utilization of available vaccines, particularly to eligible persons in states and local government areas. Vaccines have a long trajectory from development to acquisition, which uh, our colleagues at MPACD and all our partners have supported us with. And then the regulatory process, and we'll hear from DG NAVDAC in a few minutes. But the next step of this will depend on healthcare workers. The distribution and making these vaccines available to the last mile will depend on an incredible group of Nigerians that have been working hard for the last 18 months to deliver vaccines, to test people, to do contact tracing, to treat individuals. Our treatment centers are filling up again. Healthcare workers are working through the night, every day, making sure they serve Nigerians. So as we celebrate the acquisition of these vaccines today and begin the second phase of distribution. I'd like to acknowledge all the healthcare workers across our country that have been working so hard in this response and will continue working hard. 
and ask Nigerians please to keep supporting them as they deliver on the, these vaccines. As we start queuing up from tomorrow to get vaccinated, please be patient. Be patient with our colleagues. Line up carefully. They will get to everyone. Across every state in Nigeria, healthcare workers are preparing as we speak to deliver these vaccines to Nigerians. Pictures of the National Identification Management Commission NIMSI office in Alausa, Ikeja, Lagos, which is presently under lock due to lingering concerns of COVID-19 contraction within the environment. And due to this, Nigerians are not admitted to the office to capture for the National Identification Number process, but are referred to other centres to register. Bring you more updates on that story as we get it. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization has added three new drugs as potential COVID-19 treatments for hospitalized people as it expands its global trial to 52 countries. The three drugs were selected by an independent expert panel for their potential in reducing the risk of death in hospitalized patients. According to the director of the WHO, finding more effective and accessible therapeutics for COVID-19 patients remains a critical need in the global fight. When COVID-19 was first detected in Wuhan, China, no one thought that it would spread to countries confirming millions of cases and that millions more people would die. The grim statistics, however, changes to optimism when you look at the number of recoveries spread around many regions and territories of the world. One key to fighting the novel virus, apart from vaccines, was the WHO solidarity trials, working with countries to find effective treatments for COVID-19. These trials usually involve hospitals, countries and thousands of patients. At some point, four drugs evaluated by the trial showed remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir and interferon had little or no effect on people admitted to hospital with the virus. But now, the expansion of the trial now includes three drugs, atestinate, imatinib and infliximab. Solidarity Plus will test three drugs, artesanate, a treatment for severe malaria, imatinib, a drug for certain cancers, and infliximab, a treatment for immune system disorders such as Crohn's disease. These drugs were chosen by an independent panel of experts that evaluates all the available evidence on all potential therapeutics. Even though the WHO has so far recommended only two treatments for COVID-19, including interleukine-6 receptor blockers recommended last month and corticosteroids, dexamethasone, a widely available steroid, was also found to reduce the number of deaths in patients on ventilators. Time will tell what the results of this new edition will be as the world battles a new surge in the pandemic fueled by the highly transmissible Delta variant. Well, joining us for more is uh, pharmacist Stephen Chibiojo. He's a clinical pharmacist, specialist drug quality control and drug production with the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital, Guagualada. He joins us from Abuja Studios. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. What's your take so far on the WHO solidarity clinical trials for COVID-19? Uh, the Solidarity Plus clinical trial, it's an unprecedented global uh, intervention in the COVID um, pandemic. And um, from what they are doing, about 52 countries are involved. And we have over 600 hospitals across the world. And we also have thousands of clinical researchers. And with this, we have a lot of patients available for this clinical research. We have over 3 million patients available. So with this, with this um, Solidarity Plus research, we do hope that um, 
they will be able to come out with good therapeutic approach that will be able to handle coronavirus. Because as we speak, we already have diagnostic procedures, we have robust di diagnostic procedures, and we also have the vaccines being rolled out. But in adventure, in a case where we have uh, a patient that comes down with this disease, how can we handle it? And that is a therapeutic approach. So with clinical trial that they are doing, which is the strongest evidence that we need in evidence-based medicine to take decision in drugs to be used in new diseases. Um, this clinical trial, Solidarity Plus, is going to help us to be able to come out with definite drugs that will have impact on coronavirus. Now, unfortunately, the WHO said like remdesivir or hydroxychloroquine that it had little or no effect on people admitted to hospital or with COVID-19. Do you still agree with that, especially after some Nigerians said that they recovered on the back of those treatments, especially hydroxychloroquine? Um, that is true. There's something that is very interesting about science. In science, we deal with evidence-based. However, when we talk about um, the hydroxychloroquine, uh, in in vivo, uh, in vitro trial, we discovered that um, hydroxychloroquine has antiviral properties. However, with the current knowledge that we have, we discovered that the antiviral property that it has outside the body could not translate to significant clinical impact on patients. Uh, clinical research has helped us to discover that some of the people who are claiming that hydroxychloroquine had helped them in the time past, they were taking cocktail of drugs. Some were taking vitamin D, zinc, vitamin C, high dose vitamin C. Some were on natural immune boosters like ginger um, and the rest of them. So with that, we cannot say it was just hydroxychloroquine that healed them. The cocktail of drugs which helped to boost their immune profile was one of the things that helped them to recover. So it's definitely not just hydroxychloroquine. So with what we are doing now, the uh, WHO is doing, the research and the R&D department is doing, it will help us to have evidence based. For instance, we have about 3 million patients hospitalized across, across the globe who have been exposed to various kinds of drugs, the artesanate, infliximab, and imatinib. And at the end of the day, we'll be able to have good results. Because in clinical research, what we are looking at is the size of the sample. Before now, we have had researches, about 3,000 research has been reported, published globally. But uh, evidence has shown that the sample size was very small. So in, in science, we do sample size, but the larger your sample size, the better the result, because we are going to be extrapolating this result to a wider population. So with this, well, I'm very sure that we'll get a better result than the previous researches that were done. And finally, Mr. Chibuyojo, in just a few seconds, um, does this also point to how closely COVID-19 is similar to malaria, seeing as uh, one of the new drugs as well uh, going through the trials is atesinate? Yes. Um, also, like I have always said, in medicine, we deal with evidence-based results. And most clinical researchers or si uh, clinical scientists, what they look at is they treat based on symptoms. And I think that was what brought in artesanate because COVID-19 has a lot of symptoms that are similar to that of malaria. And so they kept selecting various drugs and trying them. And uh, from the few researches out of the 3,000 clinical researches that have been published thus far, um, a lot has indicated, have indicated that artesanate has good activities against coronavirus. Now it has been included in the Solidarity Plus, which is an unprecedented global clinical trial. Um, at the end of this uh, research, we'll be able to know for sure if it indeed has good activities against coronavirus compared right. with the other drugs that are being used currently, infliximab and uh, imatinib. 
We appreciate your time on the program. Thank you so much, clinical pharmacist Stephen Chubuyojo, specialist drug quality control with Guagualada Hospital. Uh, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. Still to come, almost 800 people test positive for COVID-19 in a sample size of over 5,000 tested in the last 24 hours in Kenya. Please stay with us. In Jigao State, hospital staff are receiving training on oxygen administration to patients battling with COVID-19 and pneumonia. Experts from the Aminokano Teaching Hospital say the training is meant to enhance their capacity in handling patients in dire need of oxygen to survive. Amidst the recent surge in COVID-19 daily infections in Nigeria, spurred by the discovery of Delta variant, Jigao State, according to the NCDC, accounts for one of the states with the lowest statistics, including 562 confirmed cases and 25 cases currently on admission. Health experts say that oxygen is the single most important medicine for severe and critical COVID-19 patients. And to ensure case management, the state government and other partners are working towards improving access to medical oxygen aimed at reducing child death from pneumonia and other infectious diseases. At the Rashid Shakun Teaching Hospital, Duse, some of the partners are here to demonstrate how to use the medical oxygen. Oxygen therapy is oxygen therapy. Now, in the context of COVID-19, you will need oxygen. Now, it's not just the supply of the oxygen, but you need to know how to administer it properly. Because if you don't know how to administer it properly, uh, you'll be wasting this precious uh, uh, commodity. And uh, uh, with the, not only that they have uh, other sources of oxygen, like the oxygen concentrator, which you, when you have electricity, you can conserve the ones, the compressed oxygen in the cylinder. It's a golden opportunity they gave to us to support people of Jugawa State and people of Lagos State in the south. It is through their funding and the technical expertise of Serbi Children, which is a very renowned organization, that we are doing this training. And the trainings are various categories. What you are seeing today is just one category which is called the training in pulse oximetry and oxygen therapy. The trainees believe that the program will enhance their capacity to efficiently manage several health challenges. It teach us the type of method you are going to apply in administering oxygen, unlike before. As the patient comes, we used to use any available method to introduce the oxygen. So we now learn that some patient needs so so liter. If they fail, you now go to another method. If also this one fail, you now go to another method again. Through the course of this training, I have come to uh, re, um, learn new things and also remember things that I used to know before. Things uh, mainly concerning oxygen therapy, what um, things to change, and then when um, you don't have some things, you uh, re when to refer the patient to a higher centre. While the government is working to scale up oxygen delivery across all health facilities in the state, this training is expected to enhance the capacity of the frontline workers in providing oxygen therapy to those in need. Sadiq Ilyasu, Channel's Television News. Away from Nigeria, at least 134 patients are in the intensive care units, 53 of whom are on ventilatory support, 74 on supplemental oxygen, while seven others are under observation. As of Saturday in Kenya, a total of over 2 million vaccines have been administered across the country. The uptake of the second dose among those who received their first dose is at 58.0%, with the majority being males at 55%. Um, we have more on the situation joining us. Uh, from Kenya is Dr. Loki Mwange. He's a general practitioner from Nairobi. Thank you for joining us on the program. I'd like to begin with um, the vaccination uptake. Tell us about the drive in Kenya, uh, especially since it saw, you know, a surge in cases. And is there, are there enough vaccines to go around the population? Okay, first of all, uh, can you hear me? Very well. Okay, first of all, thank you for having me on your program. 
Uh, as you've said, my name is Dr. Lucky Mwange. I'm a general practitioner. So um, regarding the vaccines, um, yes, uh, there's been a very huge drive in Kenya. Uh, I must admit that uh, this is not the time when uh, people were skeptical about vaccines. When COVID came to Kenya at first, we were very skeptical because uh, there was this notion that Africans wouldn't suffer from COVID and that uh, if we would get COVID, it would be uh, less significant than what we were seeing in uh, countries like uh, France, the US, and uh, mainly in Europe and uh, Asian countries. But uh, now uh, almost everyone knows someone who has died. And um, this has really helped to build the uh, vaccination sensitization since now people have understood that COVID is real and um, uh, it's a huge thing now. So um, we're having vaccination drives uh, in the country. Uh, we're having uh, it being done by the local leaders. We're having it being done by the church. The clergy members are doing it. We're having it being led by the celebrities. And uh, basically, yes, the vaccination drive has really gone high. And um, uh, unfortunately, we are still in a position where the demand of these vaccines out, outweighs the supply. Since uh, we received uh, 180,000 doses of AstraZeneca from uh, that was the, from the Greek government, we also received um, uh, one around uh, 410,000 doses from the UK government, and uh, we are all okay. Those are the AstraZeneca vaccines. So we are currently waiting for uh, Pfizer vaccines. Uh, this was uh, this is actually planned by the U.S. government, and uh, around uh, 1.7 million vaccines from Pfizer we're expecting from the U.S. government. Uh, this will help to augment the vaccination drive. Yes. Dr. Mwange, quite an expensive rollout plan there, but. Quickly tell us, um, Kenya is also known for its matatas, the minibuses that often transport more people than they have seats. I mean, are there fears that the informal network could be a weak link in the fight against the virus? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, Kenya is known for matatus. It's part of our culture. And uh, for those who don't know what matatus are, these are public service vehicles uh, that uh, carry passengers and um, Yes, so they are part of the huge uh, transport infrastructure that we have in this country. And um, uh, of, uh, before this directive was uh, done last week, prior to last week, we had a, a reduction in the capacity that matatus would carry. So you have like a 14-seater matatu was supposed to carry only half the capacity. So we are talking about seven people in a 14-seater matatu. So now for COVID, uh, it's... Basically, it's a uh, you social distance, and you expect not to get this virus. So um, yes, there was this issue. We understand we're in a third world country, and um, uh, we are we have a very progressive uh, population. So um, there were all these challenges about uh, what really is the greatest threat: no, is right. it the livelihood or is it the vaccine? So oh, sorry, is it the virus? So um, there were these challenges about the economic implications of uh, halving the, the capacity of matatus, and uh, it really helped to contain the virus. But now that we're having full capacity being done currently, uh, it's a challenge because now uh, when we were carrying a half capacity, you'd have a one meter social distance between you and the next person sitting next to you. But now that we are back to full capacity, uh, the person seated next to you is actually just uh, next to your shoulder. And uh, if this person has COVID, God forbid, uh, if you're not masked, you'll get it. And uh, we all know how these things happen. Indeed. Uh, most people do things. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Manga, essentially, it is a challenge, and hopefully, you know, the government will look into it, especially for Matatu companies and also the protocols passengers should be taking. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Dr. Loki Mwange is a general practitioner from Nairobi. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you so much for having me.
Australia's biggest city of Sydney recorded its deadliest day of COVID-19 today as troops and police set up roadblocks to limit the movement of people while Melbourne faced a nightly curfew and a further two weeks of lockdown. A nurses association has warned that the Philippines could face a shortage of nurses if the government fails to act on their demand of more timely compensations and better benefits. The president of the association, Norbert Ray, says nurses have been demoralized after they did not receive months of special risk allowance and other compensations, saying the funds released under an administrative order by the president were supposed to be paid out to the healthcare workers dealing with COVID-19 on a monthly basis. There are also protests in Thailand over the prime minister's handling of the pandemic. Earlier today, police used water cannon and tear gas to disperse protesters near the PM's office. As opposition parties moved to censor Mr. Prayut chan in parliament, hundreds marched to the government house to demand Prayut resigns in what has become the latest show of growing public anger over a worsening epidemic and a chaotic vaccine rollout. Over in Vietnam, as coronavirus lockdown curbs are extended for another month, thousands of workers have been leaving Ho Chi Minh City. The country has been battling its worst outbreak yet, facing over 200 deaths a day, being the epicenter. State television VTV is reporting that many motorcyclists were stopped at barricades set up by the authorities in an effort to stop people from traveling. In the capital, Hanoi, police are enforcing curbs and checking people's travel documents while restaurants and businesses remain closed. Australia's biggest city of Sydney today recorded its deadliest day of the COVID-19 pandemic while residents in Melbourne face a nightly curfew and a further two weeks of lockdown amid a surge in infections. 200 troops have been deployed across Sydney to enforce the city's eighth week of a COVID-19 lockdown. It comes as the city records its largest one-day rise in COVID-19 cases since the pandemic began. Remember that the coronavirus can leave on the surface for several hours. Continue to take responsibility. You can visit our website at channelcv.com for the latest on the pandemic, several other breaking stories. It's channelcv.com. Thank you for watching the program this evening. I'm Melissa Antonwonka. Stay safe.